BYOD signals and connectivity, let's get started. This is probably one of the three most important topics right now in AV, at least in my opinion, right? If we really think about it, what are the things that we have to worry about? Not for the projects that you already have happening, but the projects that you're going to have happening next year and the years beyond. So what are the things that are driving changes in the marketplace? 4K video, I think, is a question we can't afford to miss. That's very, very important. And how we ad uh, adapt to that is very, very important. But equally is this. How do we take products from the desktop, products that belong in your pocket, products that travel with you, products that are consumer products that, dare I say, in the AV industry, we've never really looked at these products and said these were AV sources. And now we're being expected to integrate these into fixed AV assets. This is quite the challenge, and there's a lot that we have to discuss. I think those are two of the really big questions we're going to look at in our industry going forward, 4K and BYOD. Of course, there are a few others that, out th that are out there, including a brand new USB technology, which I will touch on in this presentation. So let's get started. I like this statistic because it gives me a sense of scale. 1.62 billion mobile devices will be in the workplace by the end of next year. That's enormous. I want you to think about this. There's a little less than 7 billion of us on the planet. 1.62 billion devices just for us to go to work. That's pretty big numbers. And when we look at some of the facts about BYOD, um, there's a few things we want to look at. First, 38% of the companies surveyed said, we're going to stop providing devices to workers in the next couple of years. Why? I want you to think about this. How many of you carry your own personal cell phone by a show of hands? There you go, about two thirds of the industry. How many of you also carry a work cell phone? And about half the hands. Isn't that a little silly? If you think about it, why do you need two? Two things to charge, two things to keep track of, two things to worry about. And the reality is, at least my experience has been, that a lot of times the work technology doesn't keep up with the technology that I want. Which brings us to the second part of this. The BYOD market in North America is going to grow from about $30 billion in 2014 last year to about $90 billion in 2019. A $60 billion market increase. And the AV worldwide market is about $180 billion. So this is 30% of the world AV talking about in portable devices. In the European market, it's going to go from a $20 billion market to a $75 billion market. We're talking $115 billion market influence over the next four to five years. That's an astonishing number. And companies are not only saving money, but more importantly, and there's a statistic that's on here, less than one quarter of all IT managers view cost savings as a key benefit of BYOD programs. In other words, when we look at this, less than 25% of the folks who are making the decisions about this technology are saying, we want BYOD, so you pay for your cell phone and we save that money. That is not how this works. In fact, the reason we want to do this is, if you bring in your cell phone, if you bring in your tablet, if you bring in your device, your efficiency increases because you know how to use it. You selected it because it fits your personality. And in order for us to be more effective in the industry, we have to increase productivity. That's how we increase increase profitability. That's how we increase business reach, is by increasing our productivity. And that's what BYOD really does. So when we think about it, why do we really want to look at BYOD in business? Well, mostly because your customers are absolutely demanding it, but they're demanding it because it allows the owner of BYOD to have one device for personal and professional needs. It allows that individual to choose the device that best fits their personality and their needs. It allows, believe it or not, an increased measure of privacy. Because now, when you email the kids, when you text your wife, when you email your friends about going to a ball game, that data is your responsibility. It is not residing on somebody else's network. And you tend to be more protective right of your data than you would of somebody else's. That's just human nature. So we're going to have better levels of uh, privacy, also better levels of flexibility. And this is really driven home to me at a very, very personal level, right? The IT department within Legrand, wonderful guys, they work very, very hard, wonderful guys and gals that are out there, but they have a schedule for when they're going to deliver new computers and new software.
And what I do as the technology evangelist is out ahead of what's happening in the industry. So when Windows 10 became available on July 29th, I was downloading it on July 30th. There's no company in the world that's willing to take that kind of a risk in their IT department. So we have a much better uh, ability to be flexible and to make sure that the employees are getting the kind of technology that we need. And finally, protection. The end user's data, your data, your profile, your configurations, your applications, they all retain under your control. They're not going to go to somebody else. And frankly, the businesses really don't benefit from being responsible for this. It's an, ex an, an, it's, it's an excessive burden for them to protect both ends of the equation. Why not leave it in the hands of where it's going to get the most attention? So BYOD has a very, very strong argument for it. When we think of BYOD, we tend to think of cell phones, but there's a lot more than cell phones that are at stake here. There's all forms of tablets and convertibles and laptops and computers. There's all forms of cell phones and GPS and navigation and communication devices. There are hundreds of devices. They're not necessarily very expensive, but the one overriding question that we really have to be able to answer to be effective in this industry is, how are we going to connect all this stuff? How do I get this to happen? And I'm not going to go down the path of talking about operating systems, but I just want to point out something. Has anybody in this audience, has anybody here messed around with Windows 10? We have, we have a few hands that are going up. Anybody looked at Windows 10 on a mobile device, on a phone? Right? They have a new Lumia coming out, which, by the way, is absolutely stunning. So here's what Windows 10 allows you to do, and I think this is a harbinger of things to come. Imagine a cell phone being able to take a cell phone, and it's a cell phone. It operates like a cell phone. And then I either wirelessly or wired, using a USB Type-C or whatever other kind of connector, connect it to a keyboard, a mouse, and a monitor, and Windows 10 reconfigures itself into the Windows desktop that's on your computer. Unplug it from that monitor, and it reconfigures itself back into being a phone. Why? 1985, the, one of the world's great supercomputer achievements was realized. Anybody remember hearing um, about the, uh, the, the supercomputer at UC Berkeley? Um, and I just went kind of blank on it, the round one, what's it called? You know. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't have the, okay. Well, supercomputer of the 1980s. All right, if we look at some of the supercomputers that are out there, these were multi-billion dollars. In fact, Cray. It was the Cray supercomputer. See, I told you you knew it. The Cray supercomputer. Anybody hear of the Cray supercomputer? Yeah. So back in 1985, that supercomputer, most powerful computer in the world for its time, was utilized for modeling thermonuclear explosions and climate. Those were the two things it could do, right? 1985. Today, my Android, your iPhone, your Windows phone, and I'm not making this up, has a thousand times more computational power and is one million times less expensive than that 1985 supercomputer. So why are we carrying a laptop and a convertible and a tablet and a cell phone when in reality we have probably more computing power in our cell phone right now than we had in the laptop that we were carrying four or five years ago. That's a simple uh, uh, statement of fact. And we have to be able to connect this stuff if we're going to be able to evolve. So BYOD is going to do something that I think is very important. When we look at integrating these personal devices, it really is going to shine a spotlight on wireless problems and interconnectivity problems that have been masked in the past. And I love this quote. Nikola Tesla, one of my true heroes, one of the true heroes of our industry. I love this quote from him. I have not failed. I have simply found 10,000 ways that that's not going to work. And think about it, right? That's how we go about our business. So how can we do this? Well, wireless solutions are really simple if you think about it, right? There's an equation that adds all of this up. You must have the device, and each one of those devices must have an additional thing, and that is it must have something in common. And if we're going to do it wirelessly, that has to be some kind of a radio transmitter. If we're going to do it wired, that must be some kind of underlying connectivity protocol that works. And if we have a device, devices in common, and we have interfaces in common, then we equal the potential for connectivity. So think about this. We're not going to have a new method of connecting in a conference room if every cell phone and every tablet and every computer already has a radio operating at 802.11, operating in 2.4 and 5 gig. It follows that that's going to be the technology that we're going to be using to make these connections. Because we're not going to be able to put a different radio transmitter into all of the billions of cell phones, 1.62 billion devices that are currently in use and the billions that are coming out. 
So we have a number of systems that we're going to look at. How do we do this wirelessly? Anybody here of Air Server or Air Parrot? Who's here? Been? I was really taken aback by this. These are pretty interesting little programs that I looked at. I started really researching how are the many ways that we can connect two wireless devices. And I came up with Air Server. Air Server is actually pretty cool, right? This is all about using the PC as a client. So I want you to imagine what we've done right here in this room is I have a PC over here on the podium. And for those of you who are on the webinar, you can't see this. I have a PC over here on the podium. It is connected to 802.11 to our network in here. It is also connected via an HDMI cable to a projector to project these these slides, right? So what we do with Air Server, Air Server is not something that's going to create a mirrored image. Instead, what Air Server is, is it's an app that would go on to an Apple product that would allow your Apple product to transmit via 802.11 to this computer. That's all it does. It is only for Apple products. And it allows it to transmit to this computer. It doesn't do a screen mirroring. It transmits the content. And then this computer, which is hardwired into the display, can show what's on there. There's another system out there called Air Parrot. Air Parrot leverages something called Reflector 2, which is a software program you put on your computer. And this is actually pretty cool. So it sells for about 15 bucks. So I put Air Parrot on my computer, and it says on the LAN, I'm Air Parrot enabled. Now I can go to my uh, Android device, because this is not for Apple devices. I go to my Android device, and I can search for devices that are Reflector 2, and it will send an image of that to this desktop. But we're really not wireless on this connection, are we? Because I still have a computer up here, and I have to have somebody to control it. This is good for an education environment. And Air Server is very good if I have a K through 12 education environment, and I'm trying to integrate Apple iPads into a system so that I can show them on a screen. Air Parrot works beautifully if I want to integrate Chromebooks onto a screen. Chromebook, by the way, I think is one of the most powerful technologies. We haven't even begun to see what Google's going to do with Chromebook LED. So let's take an example of reflector in use, okay? So here's an example of, whoop, let me go back on that one. Here's an example of reflector in use. What you're seeing here is my Android phone, and there's a picture that I have of there from our test facility in California testing HDMI cables. My Android phone transmitting wirelessly through the LAN at my house to my laptop in my house, and you can see that I can actually see the, 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 my cell phone. Now what this allows me to do is this allows me to have your cell phone and your cell phone and your cell phone and my cell phone, all, the, all four of them up there, and I can choose which one of them I want to push to this extended desktop. Simple capability that's included in virtually every computer. I can also choose the skin. I can choose to make it look like an iPhone or an Android phone, or I can just make it a little square, but it is not mirroring, it is lower re resolution. But can you, can you see where the problem with this is? What am I doing with this? I'm adding payload to the IT network. I'm going through the switch to get information from you 20 feet away to this computer. And that may require a journey of several hundred meters to the network equipment closet on a different floor in a different part of the building and back, and we're taking up precious bandwidth that we don't have. These are wonderful systems. Here's the other system. Here's Air Parrot. Once again, I think this is a very, very neat system. That is being used with you can see that it is actually mirroring, in this case it is mirroring, the screen of my Chromebook onto my PC. The idea being I can be in a classroom or I can be at work. I believe that Chromebooks are going to be one of the computers of the future that we're going to use for work because it really makes sense from an IT perspective to deploy them. Very inexpensive, extremely fast and, and powerful, and it allows me to mirror it, but I'm mirroring it on this computer's screen, and I need to have this wired connection from this computer to whatever that display device is, and I have to physically be here to make it operate. So that's an example of these two kinds of softwares. Well, this came about and, and, and ended up with us inventing something completely different, and that is a method of truly mirroring software, truly mirroring the screen. And this is something that's really only beginning to get its legs underneath it right now. Intel really brought this about with something called YDI, it has been out there for five or six years, and um, I think we can say it was a little buggy, okay? That it maybe wasn't exactly perfect. The idea was great. The execution, maybe not so much. But they didn't stop with this. They've gone through several uh, variations, and now YDI has become Miracast version 4.0. It is 
quite pervasive. We're going to talk about that as a very, very powerful system that operates the same way but does not go on to the land. So advantage there, but here's another problem with it. It works perfectly from anything that's Windows 8.1 or Windows 10. It works perfectly from anything that's Android 4.4 and above. It doesn't work at all on anything from research and motion. So those of you who still carry Blackberries, you're out of luck in this particular classroom. And it doesn't work on anything Apple makes. You have to ask yourself, why would they do something like that? Well, it's a basic difference in philosophy from a manufacturing point of view. Not to say anything negative about Apple because I have the world's respect. This is a company that changed the face of communications. They gave us the concept of the smartphone as we know it. So we can't take that away from them, but the fact is they build things. And other companies build software and not necessarily the physical things. And that sometimes can cause a brick wall where we want to put a fence around our own operating system so we can protect the sale of our things. So we have some issues and we've tried to, to rectify this mirroring issue with some of the other programs that are out there. And let's take a look at some of the programs that we've had. By the way, this gives us a really good idea, these last two little screens that I brought in. When we look at the things like Air Parrot and Air Media, what they really are doing is going from the display to the wireless access point, we're coming over the network. When we're looking at uh, Miracast, we're going directly from the source to the display. It's an ad hoc connection between two devices and we're going to get into that in a little bit of depth and we'll, we'll talk about that as we move forward. So here's how it really works if we look at it. Let's say for instance, one of the things that I really like is I love grumpy cat pictures. Okay, I love grumpy cat videos. This is one of the things that just amuses me on a Sunday morning when I'm nursing a hangover. So if I'm sitting in my house and I'm trying to do something with that, I may decide that I want to put this up on my Chromecast or my Apple TV or my Roku and I'll be going from my cell phone at the left or from my laptop and I'm going to come into the LAN connection and ultimately to my switch and to my router and then out to wherever on YouTube my grumpy cat videos are and what I'm saying is Mr. YouTube send it back to this network but not to this MAC address. Instead I want you to send it to the MAC address of my Chromecast over here. So far so good but once again the problem becomes what if I want to mirror my content? What if I want to do a PowerPoint presentation about grumpy cats for my five-year-old granddaughter? In order to do that now I have to go out through the LAN and then over to my TV. In my house this isn't the problem. You know why? I have a hundred megabit per second wireless connection. I have two adults. We have 27 wireless devices in our house. Yes, I did a complete inventory and that is shocking until my wife reminded me it was my idea to get the wireless interconnected refrigerator, the wireless interconnected stove. Yeah, I got all this stuff, right? It's <laughs> whack. What can I tell you? Um, don't do it. If you're, those of you who are listening back, and on, on, don't do this, right? The refrigerator, you do not need your refrigerator texting you and telling you need milk. There's enough pressure in my life without having to reply to appliances. But, so we look at this, we can do this in our house because the, the total content that's on my land in my house is negligible. Now I want you to look around and think about this factory, this Middle Atlantic facility in New Jersey, state of the art. How many iPads are being used to be able to run all of those production lines? How many cell phones do you think are in this room? How many wireless devices, the 50 or 60 people in this room, each one of you has a cell phone, perhaps a tablet, perhaps a laptop. We may have 100, 150 wireless devices in this room alone. You could never do this in your house. We can't be expected to do it here in this facility. So we really have true hurdles that we have to come over. And now we end up with each one of these being in a silo. So Apple came up with Apple TV. Yes, it's intuitive, it's brilliant, it's wonderful. It adds a lot of stuff to the LAN. It doesn't have necessarily the securities we want for professional applications. And guess what? It works ideally with MacBooks, iPads, and iPhones. But not so much with the other stuff. And Android phones are 84% of the global cell phone market. 8 out of 10. Maybe not in the United States. And that, by the way, that, that number goes down to, I think, uh, about 4 out of 10 when we go to tablets. Apple has about 60% of the worldwide. And I'm not quite sure of that number, but it's in that range. So what are the other systems that we can have? Well, this Miracast thing, which is by Intel. By the way, Intel has the chips in all of these. The Intel chips are in the Apple devices. They have the inherent capabilities, but the manufacturers have chosen what feature sets they're going to enable. Miracast or Wi-Dye, beautiful. Android. Windows, but we're not going to do it with Apple. 
So now you can decide which system you're going to be on. Well, what about Galaxy? What about Samsung? They came up with their Galaxy All Share. So Samsung, huge company, right? Enormous influence in the Asian market, biggest company in Japan. They truly are a, a magnificent uh, company. Came up with a very intuitive system called All Share. And it works perfectly if everything that you own is Samsung. So if you have a Samsung monitor, a Samsung display, a Samsung phone, a Samsung tablet, not a bad way to go, it's all good stuff, but somebody walks into your office with an iPhone, once again, we don't have a solution. Well, how about Chromecast? Google, they have all of the talent and all of the money, and still, we're talking about it can do things, but it can only do things based on apps, based on certain things. So Google's Chromecast, not something we can really install in a commercial environment where we're going to multiple places for the simple reason that it allows me to mirror a web page, but not to mirror an Excel spreadsheet, or not to mirror a, a, a very specific, perhaps unique program that I might use for the business that I'm in, medical imaging, mineral in, imaging, construction, CAD type things. We can't mirror those things. So we have real issues with all of these. And then finally we have Roku, by the way, wonderful solution there as well. And we might as well throw the Apple or the, uh, the uh, Amazon Fire TV in here. Really cool stuff, I'm telling you what. Really powerful graphics generator. But both of them are essentially Miracast. And in the case of the Fire TV, it only works with Fire HD tablets. So we've left out anything that's going to be part of the commercial market when we look at those. Let's go through these because I think this is the one that has the most powerful capabilities for what we're talking about is Miracast. I have heard rumors, and I'm going to stress that they're rumors, that Apple may turn Miracast on in future per, uh, versions of their devices. Their, their hardware is certainly capable of it. I don't know if this is true, but it would make sense. And the reason I say that is you can go out to the store right now, and you can buy a 55, a 65, an 85-inch flat panel TV. In fact, 55-inch TVs, I think you get free with a fill-up of gasoline now at the local, uh, right? You can get these and bring them home and hang them up in your house, and I can immediately, using a simple touch uh, method on the screen, connect my Android phone to my TV, but I can't do that without spending money without some of these other systems. So I think that Miracast has that advantage in that it's built into quite literally millions upon millions of products, particularly in the consumer world. So if we look at it, it's based on the Wi-Fi display spef specifications that were released all the way back in 2012. That is like ancient history for this technology. I dare say that very few people in here are carrying a cell phone from 2012. Your contract's up every two years, every two years you get a new cell phone. Or, if you're like my son, about every four months you get a new cell phone. Why? Because every four months there's a new cell phone and why wouldn't you? Peer-to-peer -peer wireless connection leverages this Wi-Fi Direct. So what we're doing is we're setting up an ad hoc connection. The cell phone is simply pinging the receiving device and going 802.11, 5 gig, 2.4, what channels do we have open? We have 12 channels on this one, 12 channels on that one. Let's negotiate, bing, we'll make a direct connection, we'll start operating. It actually, it is not Bluetooth, but it is a Bluetooth-like experience for the consumer, for the user, because I can actually put in a little pin on my TV at my house, and if you come and visit and want to show me pictures of your vacation, you can cast to my TV with any of these devices. And it can do this at 1080p, and it can do this from a reasonable distance, 50, 60, maybe even 80 to 100 feet, depending upon the environment. It works quite well. And it, it does have security built into it, okay? It does not require a wireless access point. I can be completely off of the network at this point in time. To put this into perspective, there are over 4,000 SKUs made by multiple manufacturers available in the world today that have Miracast embedded, and at the risk of sounding like a Microsoft pitch man, the Microsoft Surface Hub, especially the 85-inch 4K, is in my opinion one of the most impressive collaboration space technologies I've seen demonstrated. I understand it's been delayed, but it'll be out early next year. And this is a device, here's what you can do with the latest generation of Miracast. Imagine me being up here at this screen and being able to mark things up using a touch screen like an interactive whiteboard, and if you had a device with the latest generation of Miracast, that information would be showing up on your screen. Beyond this screen, it's also pushed in a bi-directional manner. And then you could mark something up on your screen, and it would appear on this screen. 
So we can have a bi-directional conversation with this level of connectivity that's really quite impressive. But we have in fact alienated a whole bunch of users who maybe want to buy a product from Apple or who maybe want to buy a product in some instances from Samsung, although most of their phones will work with this without a problem, who maybe want to buy a product from Research in Motion. They're back. Blackberry's back, and they have a really hot product that's coming out this year. So we have to look at that. So if we look at this now, what's the next step? Well, how about an app? If we can't have a direct connection, how about an app? There's tremendous power in apps, right? This is why you bought smartphones to begin with, was because of these apps. So we can have wireless communication deployed, by, de deployed to highly specialized reception hardware, and we can have a set of instructions as a form of, in the form of an algorithm that's on the screen. So these can be designed to be a cross-platform bridge. These can be designed to operate in many different ways. They connect to the LAN. We're back to this conversation with the IT director. We have to add payload to the LAN. That may or may not be a deal breaker, but we were talk, I was talking just a little bit earlier with a couple of folks in this room who are looking for how do we get a wireless solution that works across all platforms? How do we get something robust? I want to point out to you, before I go any farther talking about wireless, that the single most powerful wireless invention in the history of mankind is our cell phone system. It's global. You can go anywhere in the world with your existing cell phone and you can connect onto a 4G LTE system. And as you're taking that technology and hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested into the installation and into the research and development of this. And as you and I are talking, have a critical, a critical conversation, CEOs of companies talking, and one of them drives down that one little road in the corner of their neighborhood where they always drop the call, and it drops the call, and you just hit redial, go, yeah, it dropped the call. It's no big deal. We assume it. That's the most trustworthy, the most sophisticated wireless system on the planet and we take dropping a call as just another glitch that we're going to put up with to the point where it doesn't, you don't even say I'm sorry, you don't even say what happened, I dropped the call, I'm back. Can you imagine doing a presentation with the CEO of a company in front of a thousand employees or worse, a thousand investors and all of a sudden the connection just drops between the projector. Can you imagine that executive going, oh it's not a problem, I'll just reboot it up here, I just dropped it. Never going to happen. That's going to be a really bad day indeed. So we find different ways to do these things wirelessly. And the one that really came to the surface as I started looking at it, and there's a few of them. Uh, Mersive is one of them that has also goes through the, the, the network, and I've been working with that to understand a little bit more about Mersive. But MirrorOp really bubbled to the surface as the one that was the most useful. In fact, we're using it right here in this room. You may have seen that we have Barco ClickShare. That operates on a MirrorOp background. We present a wonderful little um, solution for connectivity of wireless devices. That also is built on mirror op. AMX Enzo, built on mirror op. Galaxy, mirror op. Air Media, Christie, all of these things are built on mirror op, including Crestron. They're all built on this kind of a product with some proprietary capabilities built on top of them. I'm going to use the AMX Enzo as an example here of what's happening. So we take a device. In this case, what we're doing is we're saying, we're not going to go on the LAN. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take a device. In this case, it's this Enzo box. And we're going to put that on the LAN so that we only have one network drop, one security point, one place where we can really manage the quality of service. And we're going to give this its own wireless access point. And then we're going to allow your phone and your devices to connect to this wireless access point if you download an app. Can anybody see the problem with that idea? Let me tell you from the perspective of a technology evangelist who's in front of an audience every single day of the week, and I've been doing this for quite literally a couple of decades, the IT department never gives me the opportunity to load things into my work computer. So when I showed up here at this building at Middle Atlantic to do my first presentation here a year and a half ago, I couldn't use Barco ClickShare because it couldn't load into my computer. I can't load these apps. So this presupposes the idea that we are using BYOD and that we do have control over our devices. But they do give us a really good way out and it allows us to have lots of good quality communication. It is still wireless. You're still going to have drops. You're still going to have chugging. You're still going to have uh, blocking. You're still going to have issues. It might not be perfect on video, but it's better 
than having to deal with the alternatives, which is not having connection at all. So this is a really good example of a mirror-op-based BYOD solution, and it's using what I refer to as a task-specific computer to operate the entire system. Now, why wouldn't we just do this with Bluetooth? Isn't that the other radio that's in all of your stuff? And Bluetooth, it's pretty secure, right? Has anybody ever been driving down the highway and you have your Bluetooth connected to your car and maybe you're listening to Pandora, maybe you're having a phone call with somebody and all of a sudden somebody else's telephone jumps into your car and your Bluetooth and you're hearing their conversation? It's never happened or if it's happened it's very, very rare. It can happen, the chances are extremely, extremely low for it to happen, but on the other side of it, it is very easy. You can pair your Bluetooth phone with virtually any car that you go into. But there's a problem with all of that convenience. Bluetooth was designed for low bandwidth applications. When we started talking about this kind of technology, Bluetooth was so that I could have a little gizmo, I like to call it a blueberry, I can have a blueberry in my ear to connect to my Blackberry, because that's how we started, that's how I started using it anyway, my, my wife and I, and it allows us to have just enough speed to make that work. Has just enough speed to allow my keyboard and mouse to be able to work. I can, ch I can shift some things from one place to another. I can listen to music off of Pandora, but this isn't a very demanding file, and frankly, if it chugs down, if it doesn't work well, well, I just missed a little bit of a song, not a problem. I can go back and I can recapture it, but not for mission-critical communications. In this instance, we're bandwidth limited to about 720K. So that's pretty, pretty slow if you think about it, okay? So if we look at this, the connection range and the data rates make useful, dependable video connections over Bluetooth wildly impractical. We're not going to see this raise up and save us. So we've talked so far about how we can use the network to make these connections using Air Parrot and Air Media and Reflector 2, and how we can use direct connections using Miracast and using the other various proprietary systems, Apple TV and AllShare and these other things. We've talked about how we can utilize a task-specific computer to create its own Wi-Fi hotspot that is not part of the LAN, but allows us to communicate. Each and every one of these particular solutions still ends up with a negative to it. You just, you, you're gonna have to tell your client, I can make this work, but it's never going to be more perfect than your cell phone. And if you're okay with dropping phone calls on your cell phone, and if that's okay in your conference room, let's go ahead and do this. If you're okay with putting a little bit of extra data on your LAN, let's go ahead and do this. Could do that at a car dealership, not a problem. We may have two or three conference rooms in a car dealership and a powerful land, no big issue. Are we going to be able to do it, especially in New York City, where we might have multiple lands, multiple wireless access points, hundreds if not thousands of wireless access points in a single building? Wow, we're really asking for a lot in those circumstances, and this technology was not designed for it. So, let's take a look at something else. And I took this quote from Steve Jobs for an exact reason, because I'm going to do a pivot. Steve Jobs just rolled over in his grave. Design is a funny word. Some people think design means how it looks, but of course, if you dig deeper, it's really how it works. And naturally, what I'm about to say next is, maybe for BYOD integration, we've got to stop looking at wireless. Sorry, Apple. Maybe we have to give a little bit of love to wires. Yeah, that's my coffee cup. Y'all get it. The ones in the room, by the way, those of you on the webinar, you should be laughing right now, okay? Because that is my coffee cup. Wireless solutions simply cannot offer the stability and bandwidth of a wired connection. If I have a wired connection, I can overcome latency. I can have uh, network time critical communications without a really big problem. I can have uncompressed AV bandwidth out to 22 gigabits per second. We have that right now that you can have. We can have enhanced security. If I want real security, I can simply use an optical connection. How are you going to be able to break into that? You have to cut the connection and re-terminate it. And that's not an easy thing to do without being noticed. So this is secure, this works well. Well, how convenient is it? How about this? Prior to 2007, Apple's invention of the iPhone and subsequent changing of the way we think about portable communications, every device that you used, and most of us had a cell phone well before 2007, or at least were aware of them, if you had that kind of a device, every single charger was different. Every single charger was unique. If I forgot my cell phone and you had yours, I couldn't simply go, can I use your charger? We take this at face value today. Of course you can. They're all 
USB. Universal serial bus became the universal battery and the universal connection along the way. Every mobile device you can think of, from a tablet to a cell phone to a laptop, leverages USB. So far, so good. We can use this as a connection, right? Even if it's using um, you know, the, the uh, lightning connector. Is that USB? Just a different form factor. Of course it's USB on the other end of that cable. So we have all of these things, all of these devices utilize USB. Maybe that's the connection. And by the way, not only are most of the smartphones and tablets capable of this, but we have the ability to go to very, very high speeds. However, because we use these, the, these, this connection primarily as a battery and charging station, and we also use this connection just to be able to upload files, download files, put music onto my phone, put podcasts onto my phone, we're talking about USB 2.0. We have about 480 megabits per second transfer speed. Is that enough for me to do uncompressed 1080p at 60 with 10-bit color depth? Not even close. We're talking, we need 10 times, minimum 10 times that bandwidth. That's USB 3.0, or in the case of the present, USB 3.1 Gen 1. That doesn't really exist on a lot of devices. It does on some. USB does have an advantage, complete backward compatibility back to 1998 unfettered backward compatibility, which I find very, very impressive. So when we look at tomorrow, well, we're going to have USB 3.1. By the way, 3.1 specifications were released in 2013. 3.1 Gen 2, which is a brand new level of communication offering 10 gigabits per second. Now I can do 4K off of my cell phone through that USB port. Now we're talking. I can do 4K at 30. 420 color space. We talked about that earlier this morning. Now I have something that works. Here's the problem with USB 3.1 Gen 2. First problem, it doesn't exist. So you can't buy it and I can't sell it to you yet. Right? That's never stopped me. I'll still take your PO in case you want to give me one. But we're not going to have this product. It's going to be a couple, of, a couple of years away as the manufacturers begin to adopt it. Number two, USB 3.1 Gen 2 at 10 gigabits per second has some serious technical challenges using billboard chips and marker chips and highly specialized cables such that we're only going to have a maximum connection length of about, and I'm being optimistic here, three meters. In reality, it's going to be more like three feet. OK, look at that rack and tell me what you can do with a three-foot connection. Not much. You can't get from the top of the rack to the middle of the rack with three feet. So this really doesn't help us either. We have to look at it, but there are other ways. None of these solutions really address connectivity to the display with audio, video, and interactivity, and that's where we want to go. Um, we do have things that work. We have iTools, for instance, which supports USB mirroring of uh, an, an Apple product on a PC. So I could bring up my iPhone and connect it USB into this computer, mirror it at 1080p and have a wired connection. That works, but it requires that I come within a few feet of this device to be able to make that connection. And there are a few different versions that work with that. Let's take a look at why USB has this issue. When we look at USB, first and foremost, the USB we've been using since 1998 for nearly uh, 18 years is a four-pin system. Voltage plus, voltage minus, data plus, data minus, we're done. If we look at the next generation uh, or the generation that we see on your cell phone, it has five wires. And the reason for that is we have pin two. Pin two is designed for USB on the go. This is actually pretty cool stuff. USB OTG is a configuration pin that says when I plug an OTG cable into my phone, I can now plug a, uh, a uh, keyboard and a mouse or a thumb drive. My cell phone becomes the host of a computer. My cell phone becomes a computer. So USB has given us the ability to be able to do that. Let's take a look at this. VGA is dead. It's gone. We knew this based in 2010. Intel put a release on their website talking about this, and they said it's going to be replaced by DisplayPort, and indeed it has. And if we look at DisplayPort, DisplayPort is a 20-pin solution. There is mini DisplayPort on some devices. Same configuration, and here's how it works. If we look at DisplayPort, pins 1, 2, and 3, that's lane 1, lane 2, lane 3, and lane 4. This gives us multi-streaming. How many of you have more than one monitor on your desktop? Right? That's what this is. 
This allows me to come out of something like a Microsoft Surface, which I use, has a single DisplayPort connectivity, take a wire, go into the first monitor, that's lane one, I have a 1080p image. From the first monitor to the second monitor, that's a 1080p image, I can have four 1080p images, or I can combine two lanes and have a 4K image. That's what it does. I've also color-coded these red, green, blue, and gray for RGBS. TMDS in HDMI is RGBS. This is RGBS, therefore DisplayPort, when it sees on the, on the projector that lane four requires a sync, it reconfigures itself, it becomes HDMI. So maybe DisplayPort's the thing that we want to have on all these mobile devices, yes? By the way, it has auxiliary for DDC and a few other pins that are in there for hot plug and some other things, we get into that. So that really was utilized as a solution. We began to see instead of the USB connector, we started seeing Intel pushing this idea of why don't we have DisplayPort mobile devices, and this eventually became MyDP, My DisplayPort, which is used on some of the Asus, Google uh, um, tablets and some of these other advanced devices, but it never really caught on. It still has the same connector. It is actually still using the same micro USB that's on your existing cell phone, but the chipsets were more expensive than a standard USB with USB OTG. So if you didn't want to spend $100 more on your cell phone for this, it didn't work. And therefore, the technology really didn't get much traction. So along comes this HDMI thing. Now let's take a look at this. We already took a look at the pinout of DisplayPort. If we take a look at the pinout of HDMI, once again, red, green, blue, and sync. Those are the first four lanes in DisplayPort. We're just sending them as RGBS. And we have the other stuff, the control, and the high-speed Ethernet, and the voltage, and all that sort of thing there. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do that? Wouldn't it be cool if we just had that then on all of our cell phones? But that's a big connector with 19 pins. So along comes a company that says, okay, we have an idea. We're going to call it MHL, Mobile High Definition Link. And I tagged this way back in 2012 as one of the technologies to look at because I thought that it was going to really be influential in our industry. And you know what? It is. It is on every cell phone in this room. If you don't have an Apple cell phone, you have MHL. Did you know that? You are already carrying this. This is a pervasive technology and it's quite exciting. So what this means is we're going to utilize that mini USB connector and we're going to use that USB OTG pin and we're going to reconfigure it into a proprietary connection that's going to have an HDMI plug on the other end. It's not an HDMI signal. We had some problems in the early days, 2012, 2013. You would go to a matrix switcher that had an HDMI input, and we saw some of them that had inputs marked HDMI slash MHL and other ones just HDMI. Remember when HDMI first hit the market back in 2005, 2006? We had monitors that had HDMI slash PC and then ones that were just HDMI because we had different resolutions and different DDC and EDID information that they could handle. Same thing was happening here. That was eventually absorbed and MHL became really quite ubiquitous. It was established in 2010 by Nokia, Samsung, Silicon Image, Sony, and Toshiba. Apple didn't like it, so there's limited compatibility there. But MHL used this five-pin co concept of the USB OTG to give us a very, very solid interface, which is available right now for you to be able to bring BYOD devices into a business environment. And now they've come up with uh, MHL 3.0. So if you have a new Samsung 6 Edge, a new HTC One, a new Lumia, any of these new phones, you're going to have this and you have 4K capability with eight channels of audio, multi-streaming technology, I can have multiple screens, and I have remote control out of this. Wow! That's a really cool wired system. Well, these MHL guys, they aren't sitting back. There's 200 adopters and there's more than 750 million products that have been shipped worldwide that have this technology. Maybe we just found the solution to BYOD, right? Maybe we put an HDMI or an HD based T cable at each one of our tables and we put a small USB connector on it and now when I want you to share your information instead of trying to do it wirelessly, we have wired connections going to a matrix switch we know how to do this technology. It's dependable, it's reliable, it's high performance. We can make this work. MHL thought so. So here's what they did. First of all, it's fully integrated. You can go out virtually buy any monitor and on the back you are going to see, uh, and here you see this is on the back of a Sony 4K monitor, MHL, and by the way, it's saying 5 volt, 900 milliamps. That's because MHL can charge my device while I'm watching video and using it as a source. 
very, very powerful solution. These are built into the, into the displays. So if I was in a smaller conference room or collaboration space and I put a 65 inch flat panel or an 85 inch flat panel, I could just run a couple of wires to that conference table and you can plug in, charge your phone and deliver your information. BYOD, right? That works pretty well. It's ubiquitous, it's fully HDCP compliant, it runs efficient, efficiently, it charges the battery, uses less battery life, and allows me to connect a keyboard and mouse and actually make my phone operate like a computer. Good solution so far. No lag, no compression. MHL, well, let's just say these guys have got a point to make. Because they sat back and said, you think this is cool stuff, wait till you see what we do next. So now they have Super MHL. It was debuted this year at CES 2015. We've only seen articles. This does not exist. It is a brand new connector. It supports, are you ready for this? Not 8, 19, 20 by, uh, by 1080, not 2160 by 3840. It supports 4320p at uh, 120 frames per second at 48-bit color depth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 8K at 48-bit color depth, which gives you about 100 trillion different colors. We've now gone off the chart of, are you kidding me? I have no idea what we're going to do with all of this stuff or why we need it. But yes, we can do 8K at 120 frames a second. I anticipate that what we're going to see is going to be an entire 8K YouTube channel of whacked out kids on skateboards filming 8K as they jump over the New Jersey Turnpike at rush hour. Can't wait to see it. It's going to be very high definition stuff. Okay? But Super MHL will be there to support it because it can be in these devices and it allows multiple devices to link together in a cascade. So I can take this table here and connect it to this table, to that table, and finally to my computer. Maybe this is the solution for BYOD. Ah, there's always a catch. To really make it work, we have to have a new 32-pin connector that also doesn't exist yet. So keep your eyes open. I think Super MHL is a very important technology, but it's not what we're looking for. But existing MHL, you can actually backwards leverage that into existing systems. You're using AMX, Crestron, Extron, switching type systems. You've got these in place. You're running HDMI wires. You're running HD base T. If you didn't think about MHL, it is a viable BYOD integration solution that we can utilize. Here's a picture of all the different connections. And I want to point out the one that's the second from the top. Type A HDMI, that's what's on your TV right now, to USB Type C. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where the world changes and everything goes crazy. I want to tell you a story. Please go with me on a little trip back in time. I want you to imagine it is 2005. We're at the CES show. It is the weekend after New Year's. We're in Las Vegas. You still have your New Year's Eve hangover. It is a horrible, miserable place to be if you actually have to work that show. But we're there dressed up in our suits of armor and ready to go. And I take you to the new products pavilion where on a table there are 12 devices. And on those devices I point out in 2005, you see that connection? It's called HDMI. And and in 10 years, that connection will completely kill component video. It'll completely destroy VGA. It'll put DVID out of business. It'll change the way you do business. It'll be the biggest headache you've ever seen. It will allow us to realize the best pictures that we've ever had. It's going to sell 5 billion units in the next decade, and it's going to change your, uh, your business entirely. If I had said that to you 10 years ago, would you have believed me? And yet, everything I just said is absolute fact. So I'm going to tell you now, this little connector, which is about the size of the connector on your phone, is going to do to this industry what HDMI did to this industry. It is going to be ubiquitous. It is going to be pervasive. It is going to be disruptive. It is going to be transformative. And it's going to do it in half the time, five years. And we'll see it in millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of devices in less than five years. It is designed to do things that are pretty amazing. This might be the way that we do BYOD in the future. You're beginning to see products. Apple had the first product with this USB Type-C. It shipped in February of this year, the MacBook Pro. Google had the second product this year. It's the Google Pixel Chromebook, which shipped in May of this year. Microsoft just announced it for their new Lumia phones. This was on their live streaming event a few weeks ago. Google announced it on their tablets and their uh, cell phones coming up. And by the way, the European Union, remember earlier I talked about how we didn't have chargers in common years ago? European Union got tired of that and said there's going to be a law. 
And from now on, starting in 2017, you sell a cell phone or a tablet in Europe, you're going to be able to use the same connector from every single manufacturer because they don't want this stuff ending up. If you go back to your office or your home right now, I guarantee open drawers, open closets, open boxes, you have a giant crate of old chargers that don't work on anything. Don't just toss them away. There's heavy metals and things that can be recycled. Be kind to our environment. We only have one planet. But the fact is, Apple released this. Then Google released this. Then Microsoft released this. Does that send a chill down your spine? Three companies that have never gotten along and agreed on technology. We couldn't do it with Miracast. We couldn't do it with MHL. We couldn't do it with YDI. We couldn't do it with Apple TV. But they've all agreed on USB Type-C. In fact, Apple went so far as to say this USB Type-C is going to be the next Thunderbolt. That's how pervasive it is. So this technology is going to be on essentially every cell phone you'll see, Android cell phone you'll see, starting in 2017. It'll start showing up in 2016. I think it's going to be a big part of our designs for 2018 and beyond. And here's why. This little tiny connector isn't a four pin wire like USB, isn't a five pin wire like micro USB on your cell phone. It isn't a 20 pin wire like DisplayPort or a 19 pin wire like HDMI. No, now, this is a 24-pin connector that gives us right here in the center, D plus, D minus. There's your existing USB. Your transmit and receive, those are going to be your capabilities of embedding display port with capability to 4K, as well as alternate mode on a number of other uh, things that are going to be there. It has voltage bus. It allows me to have not 5 volts at 2 amps, 10 watts to charge my iPad, but allows me to have up to 20 volts at 5 amps, 100 watts of power to completely change the way we look at integrating mobile devices into the business environment. Wow, this has got some capabilities. Here's how we see it working. That little graphic you see on your left is really kind of a, uh, an infographic that shows that this one connector allows us to connect display technologies, HDMI, display port, full 4K capability, network, I can connect my LAN through this connection into my device, storage, I can connect it to um, my, my uh, hard drives, audio, this can actually replace the 3.5 millimeter audio connector on your phone and go to your earbuds because it can do analog microphone and analog stereo audio over the uh, auxiliary connections, mouse, keyboard, power up to 100 watts per channel. And what we really see is this. This one, by the way, I have a, a, a Google Pixel Chromebook. I'm going to be using it next week and, or week after next in New York to demonstrate this. That one connector for USB, it charges the device very quickly because it knows how to do higher voltages. We can do a docking system, one connection, data, control, everything you want. So now I could take USB Type-C and put it on each one of these tables, and in three or four years when you have a USB-enabled device, whether it's Apple, whether it's Nokia, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's an Android, whether it's a Chromebook, you'll be able to connect whatever you want, and now I can go to a standard matrix switch, and I can have everything from the network to the storage to interactivity connected to your table. This is how we're going to do BYOD going forward. Here's your takeaway for this presentation, and then I'll open this up for some questions. And I love this quote. Education is what, sur what, is what survives when everything that you learned has been forgotten, right? All the book smarts that you got aren't going to get us to the point where we're going to be able to design these systems. We have to jump out of our comfort zone and be creative when we start thinking about it, because we have to explain to our clients I know you want it to be wireless. I know you want it to work like it does in your living room. But is that the level of security and dependability you want in your business? I know you want it to be incredibly secured. And I know that you want it to be very high performance. But do you need to be tethered by a wire? We can do all of these things. But do we want to have an operator or another computer in the system? How do you want it to be? Because you have to make hard choices when it comes to integrating these billions and billions of devices into the AV environment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are kind of at the forefront of this. And here's what we really need to think about. Here's our takeaway. Bring your own device. This idea of integrating mobile devices into fixed AV installations is growing as in importance. It's going to be a $170 billion market impact over the next five years. And AV is about 100 and uh, I think it's either 120 or $180 billion a year business. So do the math. This is an enormous influx. This is an enormous impact on our industry. And if we have a successful BYOD plan, we're communicating with our clients and we're telling them, 
look at. We have tough decisions to make. There's no penicillin I can give you for this. There's no easy answer. You can't have it all wireless and dependable. You can't have it wired but still be flexible enough to go anywhere. We have to have multiple devices for multiple manufacturers until we get to the point where USB Type-C is more ubiquitous in the marketplace. Any successful plan must leverage technology that's common to both the mobile device and the fixed AV asset. And from my perspective, that means what's going into that projector is going to be a variation of DisplayPort or HDMI. We're not going to get to the point where we get every display manufacturer to sit back and put a new gizmo on the back of their TV. I think that that's too much to ask in the short run. Wireless solutions for BYOD, they can either add to the total payload of the LAN, in which case we have to assume that we're going to create either a VLAN or a separate LAN for this. We're going to have a completely separate LAN or we're going to partition where we're at and then we better have enough capability. This is going to be fine. In 10 years, when every LAN is a passive optical network and we're not worried about 10, gig, dig, 10 gigabits to the desktop, we're sitting back and saying, you have a petabit to the desktop, then we can put anything we want on it. But that is an order of magnitude away. That is science fiction for us. The technology exists, but it's science fiction before we can get businesses to start installing it. The reality is, if you must go wireless right now, explain to your clients that, look it, Miracast is really the best solution. It is 1080p compliant. It does work quite well. You will see if you use a snooper that we're going to have an ad hoc connection in this classroom, but you're going to have to make the decision that you can't issue an iPad to every student. Instead, you're going to have to issue an Android tablet or a Chromebook. If you do that, we can make these things work. So your client has to make that decision. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And if you want to do wired solutions, well now we can have higher bandwidth, with richer feature sets, more security, less lag, and we already have MHL. You can utilize that, it is backwards compatible. 750 million devices have been shipped that have MHL. It's pretty ubiquitous, but if we're looking at designing for 2017 and beyond, I really think that we have to start studying right now and get ahead of USB Type-C. Yes, it's time that the AV industry decided that we would adopt USB as our own technology. It's not just the desktop, it's not just the laptop, it is the interface between how we work and move and how we stay in an office and be productive. That's the way that we really want to look at that. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions we have. Remember this, a successful BYOD philosophy should include wired and wireless solutions, each contributing its strengths to the system, and it requires us to communicate more with our clients and not less. What questions do we have, either online or here? Yes, sir. So those MHL cables you displayed before, those are readily available? MHL cables are not only readily available, but in the next 10 minutes or so, or when we're done with the next presentation, I have one right back there and I'll be glad to show it to you. Kaylee, we have a question coming in from our webinar audience. Yeah, I was just gonna remind you to repeat for the webinar audience. Repeat for the webinar audience. Ah, the, I'm sorry, you, I, didn't, I didn't repeat the question for the webinar audience. Thank you for reminding me of that. I, we have invisible people in the room. Yes, your question, sir. Can we have a poll of the audience here as to the current um, stable of these devices that are working for anybody? Can we have a poll from the current audience of these devices? And those of you who are online at the webinar, please use the chat feature if you'd like to contribute. By a show of hands, how many of you are using Apple TV and commercial applications and finding it to work? We've got a few hands that went up. I don't see anybody smiling and going, I can't wait to jump in line. Wired only, though. Wired only, OK? So we're hearing wired only. Wireless to the system does not work. What's your definition of work is one comment. Yeah, right. we, we've done some wireless stuff, but the client is basically already set up on it. Okay, so the client's already made their decision. They want to have it, and they've put you in an environment where you can utilize one monolithic manufacturer. By a show of hints, how many of you have used MHL or a wired connection from a mobile device? Well, don't you feel like you missed something? None of the hands went up. For those of you back in the webinar audience, I hope that you've looked at this. And if you haven't, I hope that you will. By a show of hands, how many of you have experimented with Miracast and those wireless systems? Uh, we have a, have a few hands that have gone up, yeah, generally I, I, speaking. I meant manufacturer. From manufacturers, okay, from manufacturers, I, I don't necessarily want to put manufacturers on the hot seat. This is an Infocom registered webinar. Right? I understand. So we're, we're going to stay away from naming names, but we'll do that next once I turn off this phone. 
Anybody else? Other questions? Yes. Where does mini HDMI fit in? Where does mini, I love that question. We have mini HDMI and we have a micro HDMI. And in fact, my company issued me a laptop computer with mini HDMI. And they keep sending me these evil emails saying, how come you haven't backed it up? How come you haven't done your latest downloads? How, I don't know. I don't know where that computer is because mini HDMI is essentially useless. As far as I'm concerned, right? I have now a connection that is an HDMI connection, doesn't allow me to do multi-streaming desktop, and isn't a standard size connector, so I have to carry my own wire everywhere that I go. That one was a non-starter, and I think the industry proved that. So mini HDMI, I just don't see it coming back. Even though HDMI 2.0 does some really wonderful things, I think mini HDMI was really conquered by MHL, and I think super MHL. I think MHL has a lot of, uh, of life to go, and I think USB Type-C with its embedded display port, I really think that they're better. That's an excellent question, though. Other questions? Yes, sir. What is the length limitation of USB Type-C? Type Type I'm going to give you a very ambiguous, it depends, right? It depends because USB Type-C can be USB 2.0, that's 5 meters, 16.5 feet. It can be USB 3.0, that's 3 meters. It can be 3.1 Gen 1, it can be 3.1 Gen 2, which is 3 feet. Depends on how I implement it. So we have yeah. One from chat, yes? When is USB Type-C expected to be seen in PC and mobile devices? Well, once again, Apple already shipped the first product in February. Google shipped the second product in May. Both Microsoft and um, Google have announced new products. The new Google Pixel tablet, which is going to be an Android 6, is shipping now. Microsoft Lumia phones shipping now. All have USB Type-C. Dell has announced it on their convertible. We're beginning to see it. You'll see it in 2016. It's going to be a trickle. It's going to be the CEOs and the advanced operators will have it. In 2017, it's going to be a request. In 2018, in my opinion, it's going to be a demand. So, so are there manufacturers in our industry who are planning to extend this? And so the question is, are there manufacturers in our AV industry who are going to extend Type-C and make adapters and make things that allow this to work? You betcha, and you are sitting in the facility of one of them. Legrand North America is firmly committed to USB Type-C. We're at the forefront of adoption. In fact, Legrand North America is, to my knowledge, the only company that has Infocom and Bixi certified USB Type-C training. We <coughs> unveiled this to the world in January of 2015. We did a webinar with a thousand people on on it. We're not done yet. We see this as a very important technology, and you better believe that everybody from Crestron to Extron to Apple to Google, they're all working on this, including extension technology. That's a great question. Yes, sir? The latest Skylake processor release with the 170 chipset motherboards, you can find C connectors on that. So the latest Skylake chipset with uh, the Skylake processor. Skylake processor? They already have Type-C built in. So we're starting to see this already in various cards that can go into the desktop. This is a pervasive technology. Kaylee. Um, one last question from the, then on the webinar. From the webinar. Yeah. Okay, the answer the question is how can I debug a USB type C bus if I'm using Wireshark? Well, right now I don't have an easy answer for you, but I would suggest, in fact, I did this yesterday. I did a, a class called USB for AV applications for Infocom. It's on the Infocom webpage as an Infocom recorded webinar. I'd advise you to take a look at that. We talk about a near soft uh, software program called USB DeView that allows me to see some of the things that are happening there. I think that that is an opportunity as we begin to see this technology come in. We're going to have to have tools for installation, integration, and design. This is nascent. This is just beginning. Imagine 2005 HDMI. What tools did you have? The answer is none. Today, what tools do you have? The answer is they're everywhere. Right? It is the format we use. And I think that we're going to see this change. We are now going to sign off for the webinar. If you have additional questions, those of you on the webinar, you can email them to me, J Cornwall, C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L, -L, first initial J, at C2G.com. That email will work, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of this PowerPoint uh, if you have that. And please follow me on Twitter, at Joe Cornwall. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you're on the webinar. And if you are on the webinar, thank you so much for your time. The rest of you, please stay in this room. We've locked 
the doors. You can't leave. But those of you on the webinar, you are free to pursue your lives as normal from this point forward. Thank you very much. And we're out. <laughs> How much fun is this, huh?